I heard about Professor Papillon's work when I was um, when I was preparing for my final fellowship exam. My professor Rossili, uh, bless him, asked me what I want to do, and as, as when I was appointed as a consultant, I said I want to go and see Professor Papillon uh, in Lyon. And he said, why do you want to go and see him? So I said, well, he, he states that he can actually cure rectal cancer with radiation. And I said, I don't believe that. And Professor Seeley laughs and he said, yes, I've seen it and I believe it. So I said, I haven't seen it and I don't believe it. So he said, okay, I'll give him a ring. So it, Papillon was his friend, so he, he gave him a ring. And Papillon said, oh, send your, um, your chap over, we'll teach him and show him what we do and to convince him. And yes, we can cure rectal cancers. So plan was made to go to Lyon. And Professor Seeley said to me that, Sonny, we don't have a facility in UK at that time. And you must promise me one thing. You go to Lyon, see Professor Papillon, you learn all the technique, but you must bring the technique back into UK and set us, uh, the, the, uh, the facility up in, in, in UK. Give me enormous pleasure and pride to cut this ribbon and declare the Papillon Suite well and truly open. It's a minimally invasive treatment, very low energy and it's applied to a very high dose, but to a very small volume. So if you imagine an external beam radiation, which is about a liter, applied in one minute into a five cc volume equivalent, how effective that could be. And that's the success, the secret of the success. And it is targeted directly onto the tumor. It's 20 years since we started treating these patients and we have treated over 700 patients. This is the world's largest series treated by uh, contact radiation. You've seen this picture. It's a humble beginning when I met Jean-Pierre Gerard, uh, when we, our team went to Lyon in 1992. And I have to acknowledge a special tribute to my colleague, Dr. Jim Shaw, who is in the audience today. It is the discussion with him on our trips in one of the ASTRO meetings, the meeting was in uh, Monte Cadini, and both Jim and I had to stay in Pisa because there are no, all, the, all the hotels have run out. So every day on a bus, he and I sit together, we talked about how we could do this uh, treatment because we don't have machines. As uh, Jean-Pierre Gerard said, we only use these superficial X-ray machines. And I'm pleased that we have the chief executive of the Goldmay the, the, his breed, uh, just as the machines are Therapex, and that's what we started using. And Jim said, we don't have the 50 KV Sunny, but we will try and get it down to, uh, the lowest we have was 70, but we will work to get it down to 50. And this is a team that I led, myself, Chris Ramel, who's a physicist, and Janet Taylor, who you'll see in a minute, who was a radiographer. And that was Leon. And that was the machine that they were doing with all these protections. But you don't really need all these protections because the energy was very superficial and the backscatter was um, minimal. And this just demonstrates, and you've seen some, this is one of our patients. You can see a cartoon, how these polyps grew. And then after one treatment, the tumor shrank down. And it's just amazing. And you've got to see it to believe it. Because I didn't believe it, I went and I saw it and I was just amazed. And Kate will always say that it is something that we all learn because we can actually see the tumor just melting away before our eyes. 
And after the second treatment, the tumor just disappeared completely. And this lady was in remission for six years. She was an elderly lady. She slipped and fell and banged her head and had a cerebral hemorrhage and died six years later. She always comes to my clinic regularly, and when she didn't turn up, I rang her niece, and niece answered, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Min, uh, my, my aunt passed away. She had a fall, and then she had a cerebral hemorrhage. I was sorry to hear that, but this is one of the things that they don't die from this dreaded disease, but from, uh, from other uh, things that could happen in, in this uh, age uh, group. You can pick up the responses pretty well, by this response. If there is a residual tumor, you can have a, a technique called TENS, which is a transanal endoscopic surgery, which we've now got the facility in Liverpool and in Wirral. And then if they don't respond well to treatment, then they can go and have the standard surgery. This is Ms. O'Donnell, who was a radiographer, who's, who started when, when we started. This is Janet Taylor, who came to Lyon with us, and I'm sure Jumpia will remember her. And this is our old Therapex machine. We were very grateful for the fundraisers in, from Birktail. And I'm very pleased that one of the members of the family is here today. And they raised 100,000 with two golf tournaments. This is our new machine, which has got a little camera. And this is the advantage over the old Papillon technique, because we can actually see what's happening on the screen as we treat, and we can show the patients what is happening. So it's very satisfying for patients to see what has happened. And we don't really know why some people respond well and others don't. And I'm very grateful to Liverpool University because I have been awarded, and not only that, that has given me the impetus to work with the research unit there to see why some tumors respond well and others don't. And if we know that from the beginning, from the biopsies, we don't need to waste our time doing all this. And then we can just, from the biopsy, we can predict who's going to respond well and who's not going to respond well. And this is one of the projects that we'll be involved in, in the translational research of these tumors. This is a World Series. Professor Papillon himself has treated over 300 patients. The Gerard, this is the old slide, so he treated over 200 patients. Professor Sishi is from the United States, introduced Papillon uh, facility into the United States. And he's treated over 200 patients. And Bob Marsen is our colleague who still treats patients. And this is our first, um, second report in 2007 on the 220 patients. There are side effects, of course, but majority of these are manageable. M main, uh, uh, the side effects is bleeding, which can be controlled. And you can do, and I'm privileged to have a colleague uh, uh, from Liverpool, uh, Dr. O'Toole, who helped me when they have severe bleeding, 5% of our patients needed argon beam. And they have this little ulcer uh, following the treatment, which normally heals after three to six months. And this is what the scar looks like. And sometimes these little blood vessels can bleed, and patients get really worried. And these are the blood vessels that needs the argon coagulation in about 5% of patients to try and stop the bleeding. We have several challenges because surgery is still the standard of care and there is a lot of governance issue in trying to change the standard of practice. The number of patients that we treat are small with early rectal cancer and there are no large randomized trial evidence to support what we do regarded by many as unproven treatment, and this is one of the reasons why we didn't get it going for a long time, and Professor Jarrett has laid down some plans on how we're going to make this uh, accept by the uh, community. So far, this has not been approved by NICE, but we hope that when we prove to them that this is a worthy treatment, hopefully we'll get some uh, recognition. Because the gold standard of surgical care for low rectal cancer involves stoma bags, and this is a bag for life. And there are patients who cannot manage these with these bags. And it is important for people who are in power to realize that these stoma bags can cost NHS 8,000 pounds a year, just one bag a day for each patient. And a lot of people don't actually realize that, including the bars that be. 
because papillon treatment that we offered here costs much less than that. It's not the cost that we think about. It's a saving of lives, saving of the complications, and saving of the stoma bags over the years. There's a lot of variation in the stoma formation, and this is evidence uh, from the survey that was done over this time frame. And some areas, in some NHS trusts, about 50% of patients end up with a stoma bags, and other trusts, less than 10% end up. If you are in the far end, the cost to the NHS is incredible. And some patients, when we heard about this, they don't like being having a bag and will argue with the surgeons. But it is important to try and appreciate what the patients would like to choose and respect that. This is one such patient who was diagnosed with his uh, rectal cancer, responded well to external beam radiation, and then he doesn't want the stoma back and refuse it. So he, eight years down the line, he's nearly 90 next April. And that was him serving his country with the Lancashire Boma at the back. Some of you who are interested in these will. And this is him. And he said, I've served my country. I have my time. If I die, if the cancer comes back, I'm happy to die peacefully. But fortunately for him, eight years down the line, there was no recurrence. And he was very happy with this. This is another champion who's away on holiday, and she was really um, very disappointed to miss, miss this occasion. She was a tennis champ, and she doesn't want a stoma, because that will be in her way. And she has won many prizes since, and she's nearly 13 years out. Another gentleman. And not all patients that I treat are cured. And this gentleman, we have to treat twice. And I asked Professor Gerard, if they recurred, what, what do you do? So Professor Gerard said, if they're not suitable for surgery, like he is, he's nearly uh, 90, and he refused stoma, despite his recurrence, we would retreat patients, and that controls his tumor for a duration. And this is a, a, a gentleman who is in the audience today, and again, he refused stoma because he likes skiing, and this, this, the, having a stoma would interfere with that. And I'm pleased to say he's still alive and well without the stoma, free of disease. And one young patient, and I don't usually have young patients, less than 5% of my patients are less than uh, 50 years. And he came up from London, uh, and he's written a book called Saving My Ass. And there was a lot of uh, controversy in his treatment. And I'm sure Ian will remember this young, young man. When he came up, his tumor was too big, so we, we, we agreed to review the, uh, the, the, the lesion. After the external beam radiation, which he had in London, the tumor virtually disappeared, and we offered him two fractions of papillon. And then we did the TAN surgery, which is a minimally invasive surgery, and there was no tumor left in the scar. And he kept asking me, when am I cured? So we have, I said, we have to wait five years. And come five years, he wrote this book called Saving My Ass. I'm pleased to say he's alive and well, chasing, going to Amsterdam, trying to sell these machines now, 10 years on, without any evidence of recurrence. It's difficult for people to think outside the box because our training, the traditions, the guidelines, the protocols, and the governance restrict what we do and what we think. But we must be aware of the advances in technology, the new innovation, and we must create new concept of treatment because the stage of disease that we treat is totally different from what we used to. Because with the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program, you, you're going to pick up a lot of malignant polyps, which are very early stage, and we've got to try and treat them. As Professor uh, Gerard has shown, that the, the, the standard practice changing, like mastectomy to a lumpectomy and radiation, this hopefully would be a practice changing at some point. We have to try and personalize the treatment because one size doesn't fit all. Because we all had our likes and dislikes and some were prepared to take it and others were prepared to take the risk. This is the gentleman that John Gleese was mentioning. We treated him when he was 99 and when he was 100. He said, I got the telegram from the Queen. So I said, I've never seen the telegram from the Queen. Would you bring it in? So he brought it in and he, he said, he was showing me the telegram, and I said, could I take a picture of that? And he said, yes, of course, Dr. Min. So as I was leaning down to take the picture, he said, Dr. Min, she didn't actually sign it, you know. 
So when I looked at it, it was an electronic signature. So Queen is a very hardworking lady. 60 years ago when she became Queen, she would sign all these telegrams by her own fair hand. But nowadays there are hundreds and thousands of you old folks, as you can see, 1.3 million to 3.3 million in 20 years. So, you know, in, 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 in this era, we have to try and think of these old folks because the mortality would be very high. The average mortality for 70 plus is about 6.7%. This is a government accepted standard mortality. 80 plus is about 14%. And for 90 plus in this age group, there is one in four chance of them dying. And if there's a lot of comorbidities, the chance of death is much higher. So we've got to try and think of these elderly patients which are growing in number in this country to try and see what we can do to try and minimize the morbidity, all in shown in yellow, and all the deaths that are shown, and all the disabilities that could happen to these elderly patients. So in future, what I'm planning to do is, we started doing these international conferences here in this room in 2005, first in Liverpool, then in London, and Paris, and so on. I didn't choose the venues, it just by a mutual choice, and there was a meeting in Nice where we formed this International Contact Radiation Society. We had a meeting in, in Barcelona uh, last year. This year is Rome, and the next year it will be in Vienna. All very nice venues, and I, we have no qualms about that, because we all will meet again in Vienna next year, our team. And this is this very room where these uh, international colleagues meet. This is Bob Marsden, Professor Gerard, Tae Wong from uh, Canada, Philip is there in the background, and so on. So we all meet yearly, uh, either here or abroad, to have these. Uh, and this international society elected Jean-Pierre as our first president. He stepped down this year, and I'm now the president of the International Contact Radiation Society. We have a lot of surgeons who are ardent supporters of this. And I was commissioned to um, do a special issue of the clinical oncology, which is our Royal College of Radiologists journal. And that was in 2007. But we do need evidence. But do we need a randomized trial? That's something debatable. For elderly patients, I don't think we need the evidence. But for young fit patients, we do need evidence. And hopefully, with all these trials that we're contemplating, the OPERA trial, the randomized trial evidence will come out and hopefully this will be accepted. We've now got a second center in this country, in Hull, for the last two years. We've got two more centers, one in Nottingham and one in Guildford. And there is potential of nearly 2,000 patients that would have had Papillon. We only treat 100 patients. And with the introduction of national cancer screening program, the number that we're going to diagnose will increase from about 8, 10% to 40, 50%. And the cost savings that to the NHS will be not in thousands, it will be in millions in one year. My journey started in 72 when I became a doctor in Yango, Myanmar. John Gleese has gone through this, came over in 77, got my membership in 79. And I got my fellowship in 2000. I had the first uh, fellowship from Edinburgh College, which, which was my, uh, the, the main college that I was, uh, got my membership from. That was back in 1990. I stood on the shoulders of many giants, and you all are included, of course, but I would like to mention a few which are very special to me. This is my father, Dr. Bucket, who's a very famous physician in Burma. He was a deputy director of health school, and he won many national awards. And he was a personal physician of General Aung San. Aung San Suu Kyi, you will know, his fa her father was General Aung San, and my father was his personal physician. He died at the age of 96. I don't think I'll see 96 myself, the way I have to work. But one thing he taught me is, you can learn a lot from your patient, son. You always listen to them carefully. And then this is true. When he passed away, I was really sad. And I was feeling a bit uh, depressed. And one of my patients said, 
talk to men, he's not dead, he's within you and helping us. That's a very um, calming thought. And with that, I will leave my father contributions. The next uh, person I want to thank is Professor Maman Singh, who is a professor of surgery. He wants me to be a surgeon and he tries to train me to be a surgeon. I'm not a surgeon, but I'm doing a lot of implants, I'm doing theatre work. And he was very pleased that I was able to do this because he was also a professor of colorectal surgery. And he taught me one uh, message from the serenity prayer. When I go back to Burma, at that time the military regime was quite harsh and very, um, and it's very difficult to do things for them. And he said, I just want to remind you of the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept things that I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. So that was a very, very powerful message and I kept that to my heart until to this day when I go to Burma. I do things that I can, I keep away from things that I can't and I try to have the wisdom to know the difference. The next person that I have to thank is Professor Sir Robert Shield, late Professor Sir Robert Shield, who had a special place in the heart in Myanmar. He was our professor of surgery here and he became the dean and he was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. And he and I worked very closely. We helped jointly sponsor a lot of postgraduate students in Burma. And Marianne Shield, who was going to come today, sadly couldn't make it for personal uh, uh, misfortunes and she sent all her best wishes and regards. The other person I must thank is Sir Ian Gilmore. I'm very grateful to you for coming over to open this because he was a fellow gastroenterologist and work, we used to work together. He started in the early 80s and I was working with, uh, with uh, the professorial unit in Liverpool. And then uh, Professor uh, Gilmore was the past president of the Royal College of Physicians. He was awarding me for my fellowship uh, when I got the fellowship from the uh, London College. Bob Marsden is one of the colleagues from States. He was riding a bike like that because he had a bike accident, he broke his neck. And again, the determination is something that I learned from him. And then there was a lot of harsh he went through, he was quadriplegic and he just fought back. And then he backed, he's the chair of the RTOG, ardent supporter of our group. And he's one of my international referees for the chair of the chair at the University of Liverpool. And of course, I have to thank Professor Gerard, who is a very close colleague and my mentor and my teacher. He was a past president of Astro, past president of ICOM. He was the head of radiotherapy in Lyon and medical director in Nice. It was the view, I always tease him, that he goes for, not because of the medical directorship. It was the view from his, from his, from his office that you could see in the balcony. <laughs> that was a view to die for. And he was a founder member of ICOM, and again, he was one of the international referee for my professorship. And I have to thank my beloved Eve, whose shoulder I have to stand many a times. And she still did a lot of things last night who we were at our place. You know that how lovely um, she was, and uh, she cooked very well. So hopefully we all will be able to have a taste of what she does at some point. Now, this is the patient referral when we were in India. So I had a phone call from a colleague and he said, we have a patient for you, Sonny, could you see him next week? So I said, no, I, I'm, I can't. So he said, what are you doing? I'm on the elephant. So what elephant, where are you? <laughs> so, so I was in India and then after our meeting in uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, I was presenting and John Glees was the, uh, was the um, chair who invited us to speak. And he said, where are you? Which elephants? I said, I'm in India. I can't see the patient at the moment. <laughs> Could you see him next week? So I said, yes, of course I will see him. But we have lots of patients referred in from all over the country. And you'll see the map when we go and visit our center. And over these 20 years, we have several referrals from all over. And although there will be centers bringing up there are potential over 2,000 patients, so we will, we will not be short of referrals. I'm very proud to say that this room was full about two, three weeks ago when we have an annual meeting of this Papillon Patient Support Group. 
which has been supported by Macmillan. And Sue, who is the mother of Mark, is the patient who wrote the book, won the national award. And she was presented this award in this very room about two, three weeks ago, and we're very proud of her contribution to the PEP group. In fact, there are several PEP group members who are in the audience. I'm very grateful to all their support. Changing a standard of care for the patient is a life-changing experience with the stoma. For surgeons and as the governance, it's a change of standard and care. It's a very fine balance. But there is compelling need for the change because of the bowel cancer screening, increased harm to the elderly patient, very strong patient's voice and choice to avoidance of stoma, which I showed you some evidence of. And we, although we were told about the informed consent, most of the surgeons around the country don't regard Papillon as part of the treatment, so they don't give this as an option. But if we try to prove the worth of it, they have to start mentioning this and give choice to the patient. I'm grateful for the surgeons who are in the audience who've been with me all this time and giving the choice to these patients. And that is one of the reasons why we get all these uh, increased referrals. This National Health Service will save a lot of money by avoiding uh, these, the stoma. We can see from the NBOCAP data, the mortality and morbidity that surgery can uh, cause to these patients. And then the patients will be made aware. And the media, I'm grateful for the patients, who, uh, people who are from the media making these patients aware. And for the change in disease pattern, because we're seeing very early stage disease, we need to try and offer this patient minimally invasive treatment, which is papillon. We're going to see very early tumors through the National Bowel Screening Program. And we're going to see this center open shortly. And my aim is to establish Clatterbridge Papillon Center as a leading international center for teaching, research, audit, and training. As Sir Ian alluded, we will work closely with Liverpool University and the Liberal Health um, Alliance. I will not rest my sword until papillon contact radiation is accepted as a standard of treatment, not just in this country, but for the whole world. I thank you for your attention.